Bom dia. Bom dia. So good morning for for those that are in Brazil. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and good evening for the other participants. So in the name of the organizing committee, we are very pleased to meet you all, and we would like to welcome you to the second Unicamp International School on Development Challenges. We were really excited organizing it, and we hope you will learn and enjoy it as much as we did. So in this opening session, we have Professor André Biancarelli, the director of the Institute of Economics at Unicamp, and Professor Rafael de Brito Dias, that represents the University International Office. So after the talk, uh, I will provide you some information in relation to this school. So please, Professor André, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carol. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on the location of each one. My name is André Biancarelli, a professor, and I'm currently the director of the Institute of Economics at Unicamp. It's a great happiness to take part on this opening session of the second Unicamp International School on Development Challenges. In fact, this is the second edition in this format, but the third in a sequence, since we had in 2019 a preview, previous version of this school focused on BRICS economies. Through events and initiatives like these, we keep on our mission of increasing the internationalization of our institute, receiving and spreading ideas, methods, and especially people. Uh, despite all the difficulties, Uh, of the last times, uh, increased in pandemic times, we believe that we are on the right track. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us on this journey. This year, uh, the specific theme of uh, the school is inequality or different dimensions of inequality. It's not necessary to explain the importance of this topic for the currently development of economic knowledge. Fortunately, the distribution of wealth and income are more than ever on the top priorities of academic discussions, policy recommendations of multilateral organizations, and also is theme of uh, broader public debates, uh, theme of bestsellers, etc. From a Latin American perspective, and more specific, a Brazilian one, I would say that it's impossible to be a good economist or a good social scientist in general without a deep comprehension of this topic. Brazil, uh, as most of you uh, should know, is an economy, and more than this, a society built on a terrible division of wealth, income, and land. Nothing can be understood in Brazilian economic, economic history if the departing point is different from this. The long and cruel slavery period that only was abolished in 1888, the lack, the lack of an effective land reform, the urbanization and industrialization process during the 20th century, and more recently, the brief period of a growth resumption between 2004 and 2014 are all economic process completely linked to inequalities. More than that, all the political mess in Brazil in the last years, I think that is also related to the changes provoked by my minor progress in income distribution in the previous periods. So Brazil is probably, for bad reasons, the best place in the world to study inequalities. But to increase the range of political and academic perspectives, new dimensions of inequality arose in recent times uh, for intellectual uh, purpose and also are crucial in the current world, especially ethnic and gender disparities. With this perspective, the school was planned. We hope here to offer an updated and diverse outlook of economic approaches of inequalities and also hope 
to receive inputs from you, national and regional perspectives, etc., etc., on these topics. Uh, so uh, we 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 think that the the week could be a very good uh, opportunity to exchange perspectives and opinions, and I would I have to congratulate all the people involved in the organization. Thank you very much, especially professors Carolina Baltar, uh, Roberto Borghi, uh, Ivete Luna, Alexandre Gori, Celio Iratuca, Mariano Laplani, Rosângela Balini, Hugo Dias, Alex Paludeto. Also, thank you very much, Camila Ventura, our super efficient assistant, and Davi Carvalho, that is our, our IT background. And of course, I thank you very much, all the professors from Brazilian and other universities. I can see here Professor Arthur Sakamoto and Dominic Hartmann. I do, sorry if I don't uh, identify other people here, uh, uh, that you kindly accepted our invitations uh, to help us with your knowledge. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great week of study for everybody. The Institute of Economics warmly welcomes you. Thank you very much. And now we'll, we will listen to Rafael Dias from our International Relations Office. Uh, Rafael, uh, thank you. And you have the floor, please. Thank you, Professor Biancarelli, uh, dear colleagues, professors, researchers, students, very uh, warm welcome from now a bit warmer Campinas as we had uh, unusually cold weather over the, the last few days. But uh, please receive our warmest welcome. So on behalf of uh, our university, I would like to, uh, to congratulate the Institute of Economics for this very important initiative and uh, to welcome you all to what promises to be a very interesting uh, week for working and uh, discussions. Um, development is, of course, a, a, a theme that is in our university's DNA. From the beginning, it's something that uh, professors, researchers from Unicampi uh, thought about, developed theories about, and of course, the Institute of Economics is in particular one of our schools in which this uh, theme has always been important. We're now facing challenges that put us in a, a very uh, tough spot. So we have this urgency to think, to uh, educate and to act as universities uh, on the theme of development, of sustainable development, of inclusive development, uh, meaning a, a, a wide uh, definition for this for this central uh, term, right? So uh, these problems we now face are shared problems. They are complex problems, and most of them have a, a global reach to at least some extent. So these uh, alliances we, we foster through this kind of meetings, these uh, possibility of thinking, dis discussing these themes uh, with colleagues from all over the world is very important. It uh, adds to this uh, tradition, our, uh, many of our institutions have, and it helps us find ways through which we can build these uh, possibilities for a better world through uh, other more sustainable, inclusive, democratic uh, models of development. So uh, uh, this kind of meeting is a very uh, important place for that, right? Uh, I'm very happy that Unicampi gets to host it. And uh, I'm also very happy that we, we, we got people from so many different places and institutions. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to, to close this very brief intervention. I thank you all for, for being here. Uh, we will we'll now play a very short video so you can get to know a little bit more about our university. And I sincerely hope to meet you all soon 
uh, in person in Campinas when uh, sanitary conditions allow it. So uh, thank you all and a, a very good week for uh, for for work. Good night, Good night. I think the video is not working well, no? Yeah, I think we had uh, some issues there, but... Just the music. That, that beat is working on this one. Okay, okay. <laughs>
Well, thank you. Um, so we, before we close this opening session and start at our first class, I just wanted to provide you with some key information. So any doubt in relation to the course, uh, please write to Camila or use the WhatsApp group we have created. In all sessions, there will be some lectures from the organizing committee. So if you have any doubts, please do not hesitate to talk to us. Our information is in the booklet uh, Camila sent you. Uh, and after this opening session, so we have our first lecture with Professor Hartman. So regarding the organization of the lectures, we would like to ask you to put your questions to the speaker at the end of each lecture. So in the time slot allocated for discussions and doubts. So please remember to raise your hand through the raise hand feature of the Zoom platform and wait to be called because we will moderate the questions and comments uh, for the discussion. And please uh, don't forget to keep your microphones off. So many thanks and welcome you all to, to the school. I think we have uh, four minutes to start the lecture. So uh, I, I don't know, Yvette, if you are the leader now. So you can. Okay, maybe I can introduce Professor Dominic uh, before he starts with his lecture. Uh, hi, Dominic, nice to see you again. Nice to see you all. Uh, first, let me introduce to Professor Dominic Hartman. He is a professor at the Department of Economics and International Relations at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. He holds a PhD in Innovation Economics from the University of Hohenheim in Germany and a master's degree in International Economics and Development from the Complutense University of Madrid in Spain. Moreover, he was at the uh, European Union Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a visiting fellow in several leading research institutions in the Netherlands, UK, Spain, Turkey, Peru, and Brazil. His research analyzes the relationship between innovation, structural change, and inequality, and has been published in journals such as World Development, Research Policy, Structural Change, and Economic Dynamics, Social Indicators Research, and the Art Journal. Moreover, he has experience in several consultancy projects for the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank on a smart diversification and inclusive growth strategies. So please let's welcome Professor Dominic Hardman. And um, thank you very much, Yvette. It's very nice to see you again. And first of all, I want to thank all the organizers for this great event to Iveci, Camilla, Carolina, Rafael, Andre, and everybody who organized this important event. As you all know, uh, inequality is a huge topic, an important topic for Brazil. And I'm grateful and it's a honor for me being able to speak today with you and discuss my work with you. I think also that uh, um, my work in this case is very well related to the work at UNICAMP, who stands for Structural Transformation and Equality and is a leader in economics in, in Brazil. So it's really a great honor being able to discuss this with you all. Um, shall I start already or, or wait two minutes? Camila, do, do we have all the students connected? Do you know? Oh, or we are still missing some of them. I think, I think that a... there was one Brazilian student, sorry, Camila, that was uh, let us know that he was going to be late because he's in line waiting for vaccine. his first dose. Yes. So. No, I think it's almost nine already. No. <laughs> I think we can start. We can and start then... at nine. Uh, and then the students are getting... Okay, I, I guess I, I will just start. I mean, with a couple of minutes uh, don't, don't make a big difference in this case. So, well, I, I start. Today I will talk about uh, the association between economic complexity and income inequality. As I mentioned, I think that's very much in the heart of, of, of Unicamp University and the Institute of Economics. Therefore, I, I was very happy also the previous years uh, before this pandemics 
to visit Unicamp and I hope soon I can visit you also again in person. So um, to start, you, you, you all know that we live in a very unequal world and uh, Brazil is one of the big examples of inequality and maybe this is one of the most famous pictures about inequality where very rich people live next to very poor persons. And um, we find this all across the world in many different developing and emerging economies, but also in more developed economies like the United States, for example. Now, there's a lot of different reasons for income inequality, and we will learn during this week a lot about different dimensions as well as, as, well as reasons of income inequality. Always it is a struggle to measure actually these qualitative factors that explain income inequality, and we have a lot of them. This is, for example, human capital, social capital, institutions, taxes, technology, structural change, and a huge bunch of different factors who together lead to inequality in countries. Maybe one of the most famous contributions is the Kuznets curve of Simon Kuznets. He argued that during the process of economic development, countries would first become more unequal and at higher stages of economic development, income inequality would decline again. Now, one problem is that uh, GDP per capita, the measure with Simon Kuznets himself developed with, with others, is is not a perfect measure of, of the quality of economic development. And Simon Kuznets himself also repeated saying this, that it's the best they could come up with, but it is not the best measure of social welfare and the quality of economic development. Recent years so saw a, a massive increase in data availability and in new types of methods, such as, for example, uh, the economic complexity index. The Economic Complexity Index makes use of a massive amount of trade data to proxy the quality of economic development of countries. And it does this by measuring how many different products a country is able to export and which type of export products these are. Because it makes a difference if a country uh, exports simple fruits, for example, or is able to produce machines that make machines would make machines. This is, for example, uh, a robot who is helping to make a machine line who's doing other products. That's something much more complicated. Or in the medicine sector, doing really the newest mach machinery or medical equipments. That's very different to then producing products that are based on natural resources or cheap labor. Now, one advantage of this measure of economic complexity index, that it's the, that the mix of products that a country is doing is an expression in some sense of all these different micro level factors like human capital, social capital and institutions and how they work together, the countries are actually able to produce a certain set of products. And as I mentioned already, it, it makes a huge difference if a, if a country is based on products that, that, that use cheap labor, uh, tend to have high levels of income inequality, are rich based on research endowments, etc. This is very different than from being able to produce complex products, have a massive amount of different sectors. We need to learn from each other to produce the newest stuff on the market. And that requires more inclusive and learning institutions to being able to do this kind of stuff. Can you understand me well? Yes, lovely. Great. Um, so some years ago, we made a work where we, we wanted to figure out what is the, the, the association between economic complexity, so the productive structures of countries, and the level of income inequality within these countries. And we found in, in several different uh, cross-section and panel regressions a pretty robust uh, relationship between these both uh, variables. So economic complexity has a very significant and negative effect on income inequality. Virtually all countries that produce a large variety of different products, and these are sophisticated products, tend to have much lower levels of income inequality than countries that are based only on few resource-based uh, products. So we see in the scatter plot, for example, how a lot of the Latin American economies have a 
the relatively low level of economic complexity and very high levels of, of Gini coefficients. Now, why is this the case? There's a lot of different reasons for this. First of all, in order to do a large set of sophisticated products, you need networks of very skilled workers. So you need a lot of qualified workers, but one, you need to pay better salaries, of course. Then you need to have inclusive institutions and allow for interactive learning between these different straters and, and suppliers and this really complex structure, what a more sophisticated economy typically has. You also, you have more job union opportunities. So the workers have more choices in which sectors they can work. They are not only limited to some public sector and the few, few uh, sectors where we have lower wages, but can choose, they can specialize in different activities, et cetera. This, and a, club, a complex economy also tends to have, uh, um, be all the sectors very dependent on each other. This provides a lot of power to the syndicates of different parts of this chain of productions, but also can raise their, their uh, wages. Finally, what we see a lot in development economics, uh, a lot of different scholars showed this, that countries would uh, tend to depend um, countries that tend, that tend to be that depend on few sectors typically often have governments who may want to exploit these rents. So you have a lot of these rent-seeking activities, and we see this in a lot of uh, crude petroleum-rich uh, places or natural resource-rich places where we have really huge institutional problems. Now this connects actually pretty well. To, to several different schools in development economics. Among them, the Latin American Structuralist School, the Dependency Schools, all, also the World Systems School, who for long have pointed to the problem of how the global economy is structured, in which the developing economies basically produce very simple products in this in very exploitative conditions, while the center of the global economies tend to have more sophisticated products and they constantly diversify and innovate in new different products. This is something where this advance, the big data revolution could help also a lot in the recent years. And we can, can understand much better now how economies compute and how they are structured, how are their dynamics. Um, Typically in, 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 in neoclassical economics, you get this equilibrium phenomenon between the different agents, sectors, and so on. But these new approaches figure out the past dependencies of economic systems and how they learn. We do not see economies only as a behavior of microeconomics or my, an agents on the micro level and aggregated indicators on the macro level but we move very much into the structures and dynamics of, of economic systems. Um, several empirical studies figured out that behind economic de development to a large extent is our economic diversification and sophistication processes. And this has a very significant effect also on the distribution of income in countries. Now, also in neoclassical economics, you kind of assume that all companies in the agents have complete information, but of course, this is completely unrealistic. Typically, companies and economies, they cannot jump very far away from what they did before, because they, they have a certain set of capabilities, certain set of routines and institutions to produce certain type of products. Um, so they don't jump very far away, but go into more related activities. Now, in order to understand what are related activities and to which extent different types of products require similar or different capabilities and knowledge, in recent years, we developed a, a series of different knowledge maps. One of the most famous uh, of these maps is the product space, where uh, Cesar Hidalgo, uh, Ricardo Hausmann, and several other authors introduced. In this map, what you see here, each of the nodes is one of 774 different export products. And they have links with each other when they 
co-export products. So for example, many countries that uh, export fish might export also fish conserves or country who exports cars, exports also trucks. This is a very simple and smart way actually to span a knowledge map how different sectors are related with each other and finding clusters of different types of sectors who together have similar uh, underlying institutions, capabilities, social capital, human capital, etc. So we get, for example, a cluster of textile industries, of metal industries, uh, mechanical engineering, electronics, or chemical clusters. Now, we did in a recent work, what we published in research policy, we also showed what I said before, that countries typically don't jump around. So here we have the examples of Chile and South Korea, for example, and you see that, I don't know why this slides jump today around. I'm sorry for that. Um, so we, we have uh, here, for example, the product spaces of Chile and South Korea, and you see that Chile has, uh, produces a lot of products who are more in the periphery of the product space. And it's not easy from this periphery of the product space going into this more complex and networks part, network parts of the network. This is very different to South Korea who do, does a lot of uh, um, 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 manufacturing products, electronic products with much more capabilities in its economy. And we found out in the studies that only 7% of new product entries of 93 countries between 40 years basically are unrelated. So basically all the diversification processes go into very similar activities what countries made before. What we will see will impose a certain development trap for developing and emerging economies. We can also do now with these new methods is understanding better the inequality associated to different kinds of products. So in this work, what we did were compare, was comparing the income inequality of countries that produce certain type of products. Um, here we compared, for example, cars and cocoa beans. And we figured out that all the producers of cars tends to have much lower levels of income inequality than the producer of cocoa beans. So uh, products like cocoa beans very often are produced in countries with very exploitative conditions. I mean, in this case of cocoa beans, for example, there's still, still tens of thousands of chil children working as slave labor to produce our chocolate or better said the cocoa beans. This is super cool, I think, from a structuralist perspective, because we can map now the distribution of inequality within the global product space. And what we can see is that the periphery of the product space is basically these products are produced by countries with very high levels of income inequality, like petroleum, copper, uh, cotton, etc. While the center of the product space is mainly done by countries of much lower levels of income inequality. So in this figure, again, each node is one of 774 export products. And the color in this case, blue indicates that there's a lower average income inequality of, of uh, countries producing this product. And red is that they have higher levels of income inequality. What we did, in subsequent work was quantifying this. So what is the income inequality associated to different productive portfolios of countries? And I think this was a pretty nice work also because it connects very well with the uh, traditional approaches in, in core periphery structures of the structuralist school, uh, dependency schools or world, world system theory uh, to some extent. And we can see that, for example, countries from North in America, West, uh, Northern, uh, yes, US also partly, but mainly Northern Europe, uh, Western Europe, um, and some parts of Eastern Asia, they mainly produce products that are associated to low levels of income inequality. This is very different to the productive portfolio of uh, Africa or many different countries of Latin America, for example, 
where the products, what they do, have are associated with high levels of inequality and big levels uh, of, or, and pretty high exclusive institutions. This imposes now like this, this both the, the, the product space and the productive structure at well, as well as the type of products that countries produce now actually imposes the development traps to many developing economies. So in one work, what we did in a technical report, we analyzed, for example, the inclusive growth uh, opportunities of Paraguay. And what we found out in this case that most of the products with, where Paraguay could diversify are actually very high inequality products. And if these economies would seek a strategy what would go into the low hanging fruits, so what is the easiest possible product to do, what gives the highest income, then they would actually further go into the periphery of the global product space. So they would further move towards more simple products and find themselves in a capabilities trap. Having said this, even countries like Paraguay have opportunities to go into more inclusive and less unequal sectors also, but provide a better future for the economy and the society. So in this case, Paraguay would be able to move into, for example, agriculture, agricultural machinery or in medicine, for example. So they have based on their agriculture, a little bit like Brazil also, would have like the basic capability to move into some more advanced industries. But this is very difficult to accomplish because this requires a, a, a massive structural institutional change to, to steer this huge ship into another direction. And this is difficult because you might have uh, both the politicians, the company, as well as the voters actually, who are within their industries where they always work. So, so there's of course always the resistance in, in, for change because you might create new winners, but there might always be some losers in the structural uh, transformation processes. We quantified this for a uh, hundred different countries, how to which extent their productive portfolio is actually not close or far away from more inclusive products. And in this figure, what you see here on the horizontal axis is again, the economic complexity index, so the diversity and sophistication of the products of a country. And on the Y axis is a measure of how close or far away the productive structure of this country is to more inclusive or less inclusive products. And what we see here is that a lot of countries are able to diversify in different sectors, but they're only diversifying in other simple sectors. So you might diversify from one agricultural products into another agricultural products. But there is very few countries who actually mainly focus on very complex stuff, like for example, Germany, South Korea, and a set, a very small set of countries were very close to highly complex and low inequality products. Moreover, there are very few countries who have been able to, to move up the ladder. Really, uh, as I said, many diversify into other simple products, but now making this huge transformation into a really complex and more inclusive economy has been done by very few countries. And as we see in this graph, for example, you see here, for example, South, South Africa, Brazil, and so on, there were actually some countries that made some advance, but then with the commodity boom, they went uh, uh, back again to some sense, as well as with the competition of China, who, where a lot of economies around the world lost low and to medium tech manufacturing uh, sectors. Now, in this next figure, what I show here, is uh, to which extent we see how many countries uh, made this transformation to some extent. So we have now on the horizontal axis, you see to which extent economies are close to inclusive products in, 19, in the 70s. And on the y-axis, 
how many of the countries move to complex uh, pro pro into more being closer to complex products in 2010. Um, on this 14, 45 degree, uh, uh, the, that line is basically if, if countries uh, are, are in, in, in have pretty much the same productive structure and continue being uh, either far away or, or close. We see this huge cluster of countries who are, have been in both in the 1970s as well as in 2010, very far away from complex products. This is on the left bottom. And on the right top, we see this, uh, this small club of highly complex economies who are mainly close to complex uh, products and have been there for several different decades. Now, the only countries who really made this economic cut catch up and to some extent leapfrogging ahead was only South Korea, Singapore, Israel, Ireland, and Hungary. To a minor extent, Finland also. But as you see, it's, it's very few countries who really made a profound structural transformation. How did they do that? This is what we analyzed in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a paper on smart industrial policies and analyzing this S-curve of productive uh, sophistication. Well, to a large extent, it's a coordination task. What is very preoccupying for me, I'm, I'm original for, from Germany and, and here, but here in Latin America that I always feel that there is a very extreme debate between the left and the right. Our, we have a very uh, uh, severe debate between close the market or completely opening the market, or you should develop inside or you should develop outside and so on. What all this, uh, or, or you want to push state forces or market forces. I mean, partially this is the fault of us, us economists and, and theorizing because we need to, in a certain extent, uh, uh, make like uh, a clean th theories to some extent. But what we see in practice is, is that all the success cases, what they did was combining market forces and state forces. So it's not about either redistribution and educational policy or social policy or remoting the companies, industrial policy, etc. But the, the essence in, is creating smart industrial policies where you combine these powers. So South Korea, for example, was very good in this industrial policy to not just promoting certain sectors, but immediately focus also on this, the education, the skills necessary to advance into this industry. What we also see for all success cases that all of them learned massively with international partners. So like cases of Israel, uh, Ireland, uh, Singapore, um, they, they mainly, they, 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 they learned a lot from the international partners and multinational companies. Now, you need to be smart also to learn from these companies and make your own spin-off spin companies. And for this purpose, you need to create also your local innovation systems and, and competence building that you can actually do this. The big task, what is very complicated to do, is smart institutional arrangements between these markets and states. So to trigger both the market powers as well as the state forces. From my perspective, actually in, in Brazil, Latin America, the debate is not, should not be about markets versus states, but I think we both need more markets and we both need better states also. So in order to have not some industrial policy, but smart industrial policies. Who was fascinating, uh, a fascinating industrial policy, of course, is South Korea, was always mentioned as an example. But what I want to tell here is their smartness in jumping in the products during windows of opportunities. They were very smart into moving into sectors who had very a, a fast uh, a technology cycle. So they went into new kind of sectors where you don't need it for so uh, such a long time to learn, but jump in the right moment into this. This is also a big issue because it's not about only about which different uh, sectors you could promote, but when you are able to do this. For example, all the large companies like, like Apple, Microsoft and so on, 
they have been developed during a window of opportunity of just five years or something, where, where the first entrepreneurs were able to move their insight. Moreover, what South Korea did was not only diversify, but they move, but they also were reducing the, the less good sectors. And this were, is something what a lot of the most advanced economies did also at some point to outsource the, the, the less value added industries. So we can see this, how South Korea and Singapore move in a lot of complex products and they, they get rid of less complex stuff. The, the, the case of Brazil and South Africa is slightly different because indeed with this market liberalization in the first couple of few years, they did actually, yes, move into some intermediate uh, technologies and new products. The problem is they lost a lot of the, of the medium tech and low, low to medium tech manufacturing on the way. Now let's talk about Brazil in more, more um, detail. Well, as you all know, or most of you know, it's a very complicated country, Brazil, because it has a lot of different worlds within the, this huge countries, country. And this makes it a, a, a fascinating case to, to study for an economist or a researcher, but it's also very hard to deal with it because we have very good examples, we have very bad examples, and we see this within this productive structure, what is very fragmented. So Brazil, actually, a lot of the products are in the periphery and they're associated to natural resources, high levels of inequality, et cetera. But it is able to produce also a set of more sophisticated stuff like uh, airplanes, uh, electri electrical motors, software company. So it has a little bit of, of everything. Now, of course, Brazil is one of the most unequal countries in the world. I won't go very much in detail into these figures, but on the left, what is basically shown here is that Brazil has both uh, quite some people who are as rich as the richest people in the United States, as well as quite some people who are as poor as the poorest in India, making it a famous case of Bell India and one of the most unequal countries in the world. What maybe less people might know is also like the salaries distribution. So in this case, we analyze the data of 80 million Brazilian workers. And what you see there, it's only kind of 6% of jobs give you more than 5,000 reais per month. So while you have a long fat tail of some people who earn a lot of money, most of the people actually earn a minimum wage or less than a minimum wage. And this is only a pretty small elite class of what we see who earns a little bit more, who earns more money. Now, what is one of the huge reasons of income inequality in Brazil is actually regional inequality. Because in all of my study uh, analysis, in analysis before, we focused on the national level. But I think that for the case of Brazil, it's crucial to enter into this different worlds apart what we can find in Brazil, because there are very different Brazils. I mean, if you take an airplane, for example, and you go from, let's say, Salvador da Bahia to Manaus, then to Sao Paulo, and then to Florianopolis, you will even see from the airplane already or, or being there, it's completely different worlds. It's basically like different countries. And we see a lot of this structural heterogeneity within the, the economy. We have some places who are very, very poor, like in the, in the Sertão or, or in some parts of the, of the Amazon. But we have also some very high-tech re regions and pretty ad advanced sectors, like here, for example, in Santa Catarina or Unicam, the university it, itself is a technological, super advanced uh, uh, university, some tech companies there also. So we have all the different kinds of, uh, of, of regions. And I think in order to stand, understand inequality, we, move, we have to move much deeper now into this region inequality. And it's possible because now we have the data available. Indeed, Brazil has fantastic data to analyze. 
So what I think is that in the case of Brazil is, is important, it's not only income inequality, because to a certain extent, this analysis what works on the national level, what I did between economic complexity and income inequality is a little bit more tricky in a country like Brazil with this regional inequality, because there's very few places who are actually already on, on, on downside slope of the Kutzenz curve. And you might, of course, get a lot of migration from the poorer regions to a richer region, what ends up the rich region having high levels of income inequality. So most famously, of course, the migration from the, from the people of the Sertão in Northeast Brazil to the megatropolis of Sao Paulo or, or, or Rio de Janeiro, etc. So in my opinion, the big task here in Brazil is actually how can you develop the less developed regions? And, and how can you promote structural transformation that, that people have better uh, job opportunities there? And I think that's the big task to be thinking about. Now we started, these are preliminary results. We're still analyzing this, but what is clear that for us, so we take now the human development in index or different uh, dimensions of human development as the dependent variable and analyze what are the factors that drive the human development across regions in Brazil. What is clear is that social expenditures have a significant and positive effect. So yes, if you ex make expenditures in education and health, it can promote human development. However, we also find that this is not enough. It's not enough just promoting education and health if there are no jobs in this region. So economic complexity and job diversification has also a very big and significant positive impact on human development. This connects to some sense to my PhD thesis some years ago, where the main point of this is that, well, if you promote uh, education, health, and so on in poor regions, then this is very crucial to reduce poverty and, 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 and increase some, some basic levels of human development. But the problem is if there isn't enough uh, jobs available in the region, what will happen? People will actually migrate. They either, either will migrate to the cities and then they move into the big favelas, adding further to labor surplus inequality in this megatropolis, or well, they stay at home, they, uh, they engage in micro-entrepreneurship, what, uh, what lifts them out of poverty, but it's just not enough to have really a sustainable, better middle income life. Or they desist and just uh, uh, to have to choose to, uh, to live basically in subsistence. So I think that without a certain productive uh, uh, um, politics or, or labor market politics, Emphasis on education and health is important, but not enough. Not to see, not, and productivity even, because productivity would be one of the main variables of a more neoclassical approach that from, we have to promote the efficiency and the productivity of certain sec sectors. Well, that for itself is not sufficient neither. It can even backfire because it, higher levels of productivity, if you, for example, in the agriculture have a very high level of productivity, this might just end up reducing the number of jobs in poor region even further. So the, the big uh, challenge is how to promote the smart and inclusive uh, diversification of poor region, how to promote the structure transformation of with equity within poor, poor uh, economies of the country. And here, if I, I plot from Data Viva, um, the, for example, the, the, the most important export products of different uh, uh, federal states of Brazil. And you see there also how this is hugely different, uh, this productive structure. It's basically like other countries. So each of these regions needs another policy. We only attract high high-tech industries and they all move them to Sao Paulo or here to Santa Catarina, I don't think that this solves the inequality problems of Brazil because we might have a very advanced Sao Paulo, we might have a very advanced Santa Catarina here, but still there will be a lot of poor regions. So the, the, the idea is how to promote development in these areas. Um, what I found over the years and within my uh, PhD thesis, 
I, I, I worked some two, three months with micro entrepreneurs in the Sertão in Northeast Brazil. And I've been in pretty much uh, across Brazil now in different areas. What I think that in Brazil, it's, it's not necessarily a, a lack of basic tech or capabilities. I do find a lot of uh, good universities, uh, smart entrepreneurs, uh, and a lot of capabilities within the economy and the society. Now, the, the bigger problem in many cases for me seems a lack of coordination, how these people coordinate with each other and pull together on one string, don't just fight each other or basically separate within different clans. So um, you can see, for example, in Data Viva shows that all regions have opportunities in principle to diversify into more complex activities. You, you see all, all this ground level entrepreneurship and innovation also. But what is happening? So, for example, from this uh, experience in, in the Sertão, it was very interesting for me to see how the micro entrepreneurs got very good support from this microfinance angels. There's also this Sebrae who supports uh, small companies in Brazil who makes very good uh, education in marketing, location choice of companies and so on. And microfinance worked a lot. It helps really lifting millions of people out of poverty. But as I mentioned before, it doesn't really sustainable increase economic development in the longer run or create really stable and well-paid well jobs. What we found there was that uh, it's very difficult for these micro entrepreneurs, who for me are really superheroes because they have so much adversity to face with, it, with and deal with the families, with the different groups, uh, trying to get their business run, and they're really amazing. The problem is, they, there is not much access to credits for small and medium-sized companies. So what you get in Brazil is you have a lot of these micro entrepreneurs who can relatively easily access uh, microfinance. And then you have these huge companies like uh, uh, Petrobras, Vale, and so, so on, who also get very well these credits. Uh, I, I like the work of Ivechi Luna, for example. She, she plotted like the firm size distribution of, uh, of Brazil. And it's really amazing. I mean, it's, 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 it's normal in many economies around the world that some large companies drive a lot of GDP. But it makes a huge difference if this is driven based on Samsung or, or Mercedes or, or Nato, or if this is uh, driven by natural resource companies alone. But what the work of Ivechi shows also, it's much more skewed in Brazil than in most other countries in the world. So we basically have very large companies and we have a massive amount of these micro companies. Now let's go back to this micro level in Sertão. What is happening there? I mean, these individual heroes who, who really make their business and they're thriving as a micro entrepreneur, they are very often are stuck in the moment where they could move up to become a small company or medium company, because what is happening? They only can access this microfinance credits and they're very small. So when they are successful, they end up very often with five different finance groups. You, for sure, you know that most of the models of microfinance, you form like, uh, like five people, for example, who kind of make the security for each other that the other people are paying. So imagine somebody is successful and suddenly has to deal uh, with a network of 25 people in five different groups of microfinance. That's very difficult. At the same time, the Sotel, when I was there, there were also some high-tech sectors already. So there was, for example, a, a professor at the Campina Grande who started at the Federal University making database and web app uh, companies, startups. And they were very good. They started to sell to also to Sao Paulo and even to other countries. And some of them were even within the Sertão in some faculties, and they wanted to drive economic development in the regions. But there was just no absorptive capacity or no politics to really make use of these capabilities. So basically the local uh, companies, they said, I cannot do anything with this stuff what you offered there. And that's 
I mean, today now in the pandemics, this is exactly the skills what a lot of the small companies needed to go online with their business. But we had in Paraiba in this case, you have a lot of focus on huge companies, maybe of Havaianas, for example, and of this microfinance, but now in this middle and in this missing middle. There is another issue also is about this fragmentation between different uh, sectors. So in this network, we show um, to which extent uh, um, um, occupations share similar or different industries. And what you can see here that that the education, health industries and, and occupation, they're very far away from the electromechanical and manufacturing core of the economy. Um, this is something what we will find in many different economies. So you will find something similar in US and Germany as well, but it is different. There are much more linkages also. So you might have, for example, the Cambridge in UK or Cambridge in, in, in US, where the, the science and higher education is closely connected with the pharmaceutical industry. Or in Munich, where you have a lot of medical manufacturing going together with the with, with health and, and education industries and electromechanical engineering. Moreover, I mean this network, you 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 also would like to Brazil to move into occupations more to the core who have higher levels of, of wages. But what we see now is this huge fragmentation of the different groups in, in Brazil. There are several things what can, can be done. One is, of course, the endogenous development. The other is in international ties also. I mean, what we did in one work so, uh, um, is analyzing the skills matches and mismatches between the local labor markets and what the university actually, what are the courses that they offer. And so we calculate here a relative specialization if regions are, are, are all, if, if there are more people, for example, studying math in uh, considering the labor structure than in other regions or not. And then in the second step, we analyze what are the factors to explain this mismatching and who is uh, reducing this or contributing to it. What is very clear is that public universities do a pretty good job because they are, these are the ones who actually address uh, shortages, for example, in the natural sciences or in engineering and medicine and so on. And at the same time, these are also the agents who move into less developed regions. So are they crucial for development? At the same time, we find a lot of profit-oriented private universities who actually contribute to, to to having too much university in certain fields, like for example, having a lot of bad uh, uh, courses in, in business administration or in, in law, in, et cetera. So not necessarily addressing the most important skills shortages of Brazil. Now, we need to develop endogenously, promote the, the structural transformation into better industries who provide better jobs and better wages for people. But of course, like all the other success uh, uh, cases, a big issue is also how to create these linkages with abroad, because there's just simply too much knowledge out there to think that you can do this all endogenously. And no country did this to really catch up only on its own skills. You always want to learn and create a, 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 a fertile international innovation network. In this case, what we did, we analyzed to which extent, um, I think it's the first of this kind, that uh, what is the impact of local level, municipality level, FDI on human development. And of course you have in Brazil and in Latin America, there's a lot of uh, the, the, the histories of very exploitative foreign companies. I mean, most famously the banana food company where, where uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez writes his uh, 100 uh, uh, Semanos de Solidão uh, about his 100 years of or solitude. Um, um, or we, we have 
a lot of these companies historically exploited Brazil and, 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 and Latin America a lot. But if we go now into the microdata, we actually find that if com companies today come from countries with inclusive institutions and more advanced economies, they tend to contribute actually more to local development here within the country. So they do invest in some more advanced sectors, for example. Now, this effect is only really significant and uh, significant and positive if these companies go to less developed regions. So particularly for less advanced region, it, is, it can actually be very beneficial if a company comes from a more advanced economy. Note that we did not find this positive impact so far if they come from other emerging economies or in economies who have very exploitative institutions. Well, um, let's, let's wrap up to make a space for a discussion. I think there's a lot of things what we can discuss here. Um, well, a lot of the contributions of the development pioneers and structuralists, uh, structuralists, we can show this now that they were right. We can confirm the theories. What they made we were very rich theories of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and so on. But in these times, they were very often very qualitative. And they did not have this data available and these new methods what we can, can do today. And now we can confirm, we can reject, but also adapt and advance this, uh, this, this old theories. What is clear from, clear from our analysis is that the productive structure is a very significant factor for income inequality and human development. Of course, it is not the only one, but it conditions an economy if the people have choices among a lot of different good jobs, or if there is only one exploitative industry and, 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 and simple jobs and some few in the public administration. Moreover, what we can figure out is there are no magical bullets. It's not that the state solves this alone. There is no economy who really made it only powered on state forces, but there's also no case where you, this is only free markets. It was always a smart combination of this, a smart industrial policy, not any industrial policy, it needs to be smart because industrial policies in one or another sense, all countries in the world are doing to, to some extent. The issue is doing the smart, efficient, effective, in the right moment, et cetera. How to combine this with a proper education, fiscal policies also. And, and that's a coordination task that we need to figure out. Now, this new analysis on, on, on smart and inclusive uh, diversification makes one important necessary task. It's like identifying where economy can go, how is the structure. But of course, this is only a first necessary task. Another, it's not sufficient yet. We also need to understand more the policy dimension of, of this and how the, are these networks more at the local level. But to conclude, I think it's very exciting today with these new methods that we can really get much more new insights. And it helps us also to connect with different new uh, uh, fields and, and researchers. I wanted to thank also um, my co-authors. Obviously, I, I, I presented a summary of a lot of different works who are connected with each other. I didn't do this alone. I did this with people from a lot of different places. and. Um, um, disciplines also from physics, graphic design, uh, business administration, sociology. So I think that eco economics, and, and if we want to understand uh, inequality, obviously we have to learn both from these new tools where computer scientists and physics is, 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 has massive capabilities to analyze data, and at the same time recover these old theories of sociology, economics, we're very rich about understanding structural transformation process and, and the emergence of inequality. So, um, um, if you're interested in this work, basically all of these different, uh, I mean, most of these works what I presented to today, you can access the, them all at my research gate web uh, page. Um, we also wrote recently and published very recently a, a structure 
selected literature review if you're interested in, in these topics about linking economic complexity, diversification, industrial policy with sustainable development. In this case, sustainable development is both inequality, human development, as well as the other big challenge of ecological sustainability. And if you're interested, take a look on this. And if the Sene Piquet uh, page wouldn't be down, we also would start, we are starting here a center for research on complexity, development, and equality. So if you're interested in the future, there will be quite a lot of, of research on this webpage as well. <laughs>